Um, welcome to the 14th annual Roots of Prevention Award Celebration. Um, I am so happy to be with you all here again this year. Um, I see some new faces and some old faces. Um, I'm Mariah Flynn. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the director of our coalition, the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community. Um, I hope you were able to get some food and to participate in the collaborative art project over here with Nicole. If you haven't, we'll have a break. If you haven't had a chance for that, we will have a break. Um, so you'll have, and she'll be here through the break. And then hopefully by the end of our celebration, we'll have something to show you all that you created together today. Um, we'll be talking a lot about collaboration today. So this is um, a little chance for us to practice that in the moment. <clears throat> um, but uh, the break won't be for another 30 minutes or so, so please do get up, take care of yourself as you need to. Um, we were able to get the uh, gender neutral bathrooms on the third floor open for this event. So there's gender neutral bathrooms upstairs as well as um, on the first floor uh, gendered bathrooms downstairs. So you can go either way depending on what works for you. Um, the easiest way to get to the downstairs one is the elevator outside, outside to the left. Um, before we get the program started, um, I want to do a little check-in with the room. Um, so over the last few months, I have talked to actually a lot of the people in this room and in other rooms um, in my personal and professional life. And I don't know if like we're still all recovering from the pandemic or um, it's our hustle culture, but it just feels like everyone I talk to is uh, really trying to be positive but is just deal over extending themselves and dealing with a lot of exhaustion and overwhelm. Um, so uh, I've been feeling that too. Um, it, we're all, I think, often so working so hard to deal with the next thing in life that we're not making space to have a life. Um, so right now in the planning of this event, there were so many pieces to pull together to get us through to this moment that I feel like um, I've aged like 50 years in the last few months. Um, if there was like another month of this, I'd be old enough to run for president. Um, but um, anyways, so how are all of you doing? <laughs> um, one thing I uh, do sometimes to improve this feeling is um, I'm really fond of turning my music up really loud and I dance in my kitchen. Um, I thought about making us all do that, but I'm not going to do that. For the introverts in the room, we're going to try something different, because what I, I'm hoping we can do is get to a place where we leave some of that behind, and we really get to enjoy where we are right now. Um, and so, um, if you can take a minute, I'm going to ask you to do something. If you feel comfortable with it, close your eyes for a minute. Try to picture all that stress and exhaustion just slowly seeping out of your body. You can try starting at the top and just, I like to picture it draining down. Just relax your face. Relax your shoulders. Plant your feet on the ground and just let it drain right out onto the floor. Don't worry, we have a cleanup crew. They'll deal with that later. So breathe in now. And picturing yourself just filling back up with whatever you associate with joy and comfort and amusement and wonder. I would like to think about all of the tonight's awardees who are helping the community. Maybe thinking about an awardee that you're here for. Think about or someone that made you smile this week. Think about someone who was kind to you. Think about how you were kind to somebody else. Okay, now you can slowly open your eyes, and if you feel comfortable, you can look at the person next to them and give them a smile. Next to you, give them a smile. Okay, now we are ready to begin. We are in the right space for what we're doing here today, which is we are going to celebrate people and focus on the positive things that are happening in our community. So I have been lucky to be the leader of the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community for more than 16 years now. Um, I am, which means I get to kind of see all this great work happening over and over, and I am continually impressed by the passion and the commitment of so many people that are doing really important work in this community um, to support health and wellness and safety in Burlington. 
um, people like Barbara Tyler, Dr. Ellie Farisi, Mukhtar Abduli, Abdullah, Angela Halstead, and the Burlington Fire Department Community Response Team are some of those people. With all the other things going on in the world, it's, uh, this is really a place um, that helps my heart, um, especially uh, also when we get to read the nominations that we receive each year. Um, this year, as we were reading through those examples, it was just over and over like examples of the human capacity to be generous and creative and engaged in supporting others. Um, so I just want to say thank you to all of this year's award winners. Um, and thank you to all those people who made award nominations. Um, I wish we had the capacity to recognize them all, but I'll just say to the folks that are here in the room um, that you are in good company. Um, there's a lot of wonderful people doing uh, things in the great things in the community. Um, and um, we appreciate all that you're doing to support a healthy, thriving Burlington. So thank you. Um, Today we're going to focus on the strengths of our community and how we're going to continue to learn um, from each other and that when we know better, we'll do better um, to support everyone that's here and grow so that all of our roots will intertwine and feed each other and support each other to flourish. Um, we've invited a few speakers here today to help us honor this, theme's, uh, this year's theme of unity through community. Um, I won't do a long introduction for our welcome speaker because I think it's probably unlikely that anyone in here um, doesn't already know who she is. Um, however, I will share a few connections with our work. Um, as a legislator, Emma Mulvaney Stanek was a strong supporter of House Bill H, uh, H72 that creates a, and funds an overdose prevention center in Burlington. She testified in support of the bill early in her tenure as mayor, and she continues to be an advocate for harm reduction efforts. She's worked with us many times over the last couple of years, helping us help the community understand some of the issues around substance use and, and what people should be aware of, um, and we appreciate that work with her. Emma also says that as a mother, she feels strongly that we need to treat people with compassion and respect and commit to health-focused solutions to the public health crisis. So I invite you to come up there. Well, hello everyone, welcome to City Hall. <laughs> I'd like to express some deep gratitude to the Burlington Partnership for Healthy Communities for hosting such a positive event and recognizing community members doing important work in and around Burlington. I wanna offer my congratulations. I'm big on creating cultures of appreciation and acknowledgement because I think that builds stronger communities, by the way. But I wanna offer my congratulations to those of you being recognized for the important and innovative work you are doing to keep our community healthy. I wanna give a special shout out to the Burlington Fire Department's CRT Community Response Team and then extend a heartfelt thank you to the firefighters who acted quickly last fall to stand up this critical program. I know I'm biased as the mayor, but I really wanna appreciate all of you who are here today and your colleagues. In recent years, we have all had to confront serious public health challenges, mental health crises, substance use disorder, and unsheltered homelessness have strained existing systems of support. We know that community and connection are crucial components to creating a safe, healthy community. I believe that we must break down silos and come together to think creatively and collectively around our common values. That we can treat people with dignity and respect. We can pursue innovative public health solutions like CRT, overdose, overdose prevention centers, and more to create a truly healthy community that we are all proud to call home. I thank you all for your crucial work that you do to keep our community healthy and safe and look forward to working alongside you in this effort. Thank you so much for having me and congratulations again to all of the awards recipients. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mayor. Um, and. Uh, I think if we left some of the decorations from this um, award celebration, it looks so different in here than city council meetings. Maybe this would like change the vibe a little bit. 
We could leave the <laughs> we could leave you some pretty things in the room. Um, so thank you so much for your time today and for being here. I really appreciate you um, making time for this and for being here and for supporting the work of all the folks that all the folks in this room are doing. Um, so I did kind of a silly thing this year, which is instead of inviting another keynote, and along with our unity through community theme, um, we wanted to bring together our organization with others doing good work in the community and talk about how the work combines and supports each other. Um, so I'm going to talk some more. Usually I wouldn't talk some more. I would give it over to somebody else to do some talking. Uh, but today you're going to hear from me again. Um, and um, I want to say um, I recognized a lot of the names of people who registered, but not all of the folks here. Um, so I'm going to take a little minute and just talk about who BPRC is for those who might be here because of an awardee and not because you necessarily know our organization. Um, so our mission of the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community is to address the causes and consequences of substance misuse in Burlington. Um, if you were here earlier, you might have seen the slideshow that has some pictures of some of our work. Um, a lot of the pictures are of the kids um, in our One Voice Youth Empowerment Program um, uh, because they make great, um, they take great photos. And so you get to see a lot of their pictures. Um, uh, that program supports young people to learn skills to empower them to be leaders for health improvement in their community around the things that they care about. We also work on public education and raising awareness of important substance use prevention issues. Um, we have a program called Parent In for parents and caregivers of tweens and teens, where we uh, try to connect people to opportunities to learn more about how to support kids around making healthy choices around substances. Um, and I think one of the things I want to talk a little bit more about today, and maybe one of the things that has the most impact, is that we sometimes um, do things like challenge adult behavior and the social and community norms that are contributing to substance misuse. So we can think about what we're doing that can help provide a safe space for kids. Um, particularly when those things are disproportionately impacting populations um, that have already that are, have already experienced negative impacts from um, some of our inequitable systems. Um, sometimes those, or I would say even often, those same populations are targeted by commercial industries that need people to start using substances early and often so that they can make a profit. Um, and I'm going to pull up some slides to help make that point because I'm a visual person, so visuals help me. I promised I would focus on the positive, and I will. But I think there's some things that are important to make sure that everybody's aware of, because it helps us understand where we are and how we get places. Um, so most of the work that our organization does is focused on preventing the development of substance use disorder. So there's a lot of folks in the room today that are doing great work supporting people who have developed a substance use disorder or who are experiencing challenges with substance misuse. Um, our work comes, uh, hopefully, uh, supports the work that you do, but earlier. Um, we know that the older someone is when they start using substances, the less likely they are that they will ever develop any kind of problem with substance use. So the goal with kids, and I hope as a community, is that we delay, delay, delay substance use. There's a reason why we have um, a minimum legal drinking age and use age for tobacco and cannabis. Um, because brains are still developing and it's, those brains are precious and um, they're not yet ready for all that the world has to throw at it. Um, and so we just need to give it some time to, to learn how to um, manage all the things that come with being a human um, and, um, and do that without substances getting in the way for a little while. Um, so that means that our work is often really focused on youth and the messages that youth are hearing about substance use and the way that it's promoted around them. Um, we are trying to bring attention to ways that policymakers and community leaders and businesses and service providers and all of the rest of us that live in the community can build and support health through policy and practice and public education. Um, but all of that all of those entities are part of a puzzle. I think probably everyone in this room is part of some or connected to some piece of that puzzle. 
Um, and the key is really how um, all the pieces fit together and whether it makes an, a picture of an environment that supports healthy choices. Um, so evidence shows that where we live actually plays a really key role in our health um, and that the most effective way to prevent substance misuse or the development of a substance misuse disorder is when the healthiest choice is the easiest choice and it's the most accessible to make for everybody. And that sometimes is hard work. That for everybody part is the, really the hardest part of the work. Um, so in our theme of unity through community, uh, I want to take a minute to just talk about that um, and the things in our community that are supporting our healthy decisions around substance use. Sometimes we call those protective factors, or in my field we call those protective factors. Um, and then look at some of the norms and structures that could be leading to underage use and adult misuse. Um, we'll just start a teeny tiny bit of that conversation. Um, and about things we can start working on that help make healthy choices easy choices for everyone. Um, and when I say that our work is primarily thinking about kids, um, I did invite Cam, or we invited Cam from uh, Loft from the Turning Point Recovery Center to join and talk about this today, um, because it turns out that what's good for kids is actually good for adults too. Um, so, and even more or the same or especially for populations that not, have not historically had equal opportunity to be healthy because of things like socioeconomic disadvantages, racism, other historical injustices, um, systemic inequalities, all the things that hopefully you all are talking about in your organizations and your homes and your communities. Um, in a few minutes, Cam will come up and help us understand that better by sharing a little of that lens from the perspective of the recovery community but I just threw out a bunch of jargon. Um, so uh, let's just walk it through for a quick second um, so that we can understand what I'm talking about maybe and then how it connects to what Cam's gonna talk about. Um, Mitch, would you mind switching to the next thing? So sorry, I'm gonna switch back for one second because I realized I never told you it was on the slide and just in case you need that. Um, so one of the reasons we talk about delay, delay, delay is that Nine out of 10 people who develop a substance use disorder started before the um, age of 18. So it really is an adolescent disease. It doesn't mean that everyone, some people start using into their uh, early 20s. But if you can delay until the age of 26, only 1% of people who start using after 26 will ever develop a substance use disorder. Um, so it really, it really is something that we can, um, we can prevent if we think and work together early. Um, sorry. Move on. Mm -hmm. So, some of you in this room have probably seen this a lot, and then others maybe never. This is the Vermont Prevention Model. It's a socio-ecological model uh, to address an area of public health. This is the, one, the way that Vermont represents it. Um, but you can think about this at any level. You can think about it at a state level. You can think about it at a national level. We're going to talk about it today at a community level, at a Burlington level. Um, but basically, um, what this is saying is that if you, when you're thinking about this in terms of substance misuse, if you want to reduce or prevent substance misuse, you have to have an all-in approach. So you have to have things happening at every level of this. And so this is saying there must be things that are effectively happening at the policies and systems level, at the community level, at the level of the organizations that are doing work, at the level of relationships between families and community and neighborhoods, and then also things at the level of the individual, supporting individuals um, through programs as well. Um, so I'm going to just give a little example of this. Um, which may resonate for some people and maybe not for others. Um, so some people in this room I know, raise your hand if you remember when people were talking a lot in, um, in Vermont about the Icelandic prevention model. It was like five years ago, it came up in every room I was in. There's like a, a bunch of hands. Um, you're all facing me so you can't see. But there's a bunch of hands that just went up throughout the room. Not a ton though, so I'm gonna also talk about the Icelandic prevention model. Um, it's also called Planet Youth is the, the name that they eventually came up with for that model. Um, but basically, um, it's a model that Iceland came up with. Um, they were noticing that their substance use rates were really high. Um, they had up to four, at one point 
up to 42% of their 15 and 16 year olds report that they had um, binge drink or have been drunk in the last month. That's a really high number. Um, so they wanted to do something about it. Um, they also had their smoking rates for youth at the same age was also at 23%, which is also really high, the number of student youth who are using. And so they wanted to do something about it. So they took an all-in approach to that. And within two decades, within 20 years, these things take time, um, they were down to only, f 20 years later, only 5% of their uh, 15 to 16-year-olds had been drunk in the last uh, past month and only 3% of their youth population was smoking. Um, so it does work when we can get everybody to do it together. And Iceland proved that. They have, you know, it's a small country with a lot of resources. But I think if you work sometimes on a small level, you can have uh, a large impact like that. Um, so what they did was they created this comprehensive model. They pulled together people from all these different sectors of the community to work together, people that didn't normally work together. They had social scientists and research working with policymakers, and those folks were working with service providers in the community. And then they also brought in parents, and they brought in kids, and there was like this symbiotic system of giving information to each other and learning from each other and working together. Um, and Although it's not the way they represent it, I'm going to represent their work through this, through our model. They, it all hits these same things. So they created, at the individual level, they created funding streams for additional activities to keep youth engaged in positive activities that they cared about. They um, provided uh, funding for kids to, uh, to uh, be in bands and... Um, be in sporting activities and be in theater and whatever the things that they were interested in. They got kids and they actually required students to engage in something after school um, and they provided the funding and support for that so that kids could have some, um, something that felt meaningful and uh, sparked passion for them. They created, uh, they worked on relationships. They created a program that increased parent involvement and support for youth. Um, they, the organizations at the community um, level uh, worked collaboratively to build resources and work together to create a supportive environment for those people that were living in the community. And at the community level, they implemented local ordinance that create, ordinances that created structures and boundaries for teens. They also did uh, public education campaigns about the risks of substance misuse to help people understand what the harms were. And then at a policy and systems level, they changed laws. So Iceland has no advertising of any mood-altering substance in the whole country. Um, that's not always uh, realistic. But at whatever level you think about, um, they were looking at, okay, how do we shift the way that our community is presenting substance use to kids so that they realize that, uh, so they can grow up in an environment in which they can make healthy choices on their own and it's not uh, promoted to them everywhere they go. So Iceland was an all-in approach for their country and they saw significant results because they took, but it took dedication and commitment. It took two decades to get to where they are um, to, to get to that, uh, to where they are when I, at those low levels that I referenced earlier. Um, and that is um, kind of how prevention works. It takes time, but we can get there when people are, are ready or willing um, to collaborate and to uh, think about how do we, at every level, support people to make healthy choices. So if you want to switch, I think that's the next one. These are the ones that are important, that's why. <laughs> um, so, just to quickly like make sense of that for Burlington. So I think we could get there too. Uh, that's the work of our organization, so uh, I wouldn't be in this position if I didn't. Um, the, and the research is clear that if you use informed strategies to address the root causes of substance misuse at the community level, it works, like I just talked about. Iceland saw success when they, got, when they did that. Um, and some of the things that you focus on at a community level Specific strategies are things like community normalization of substance use. How often are people normalizing it as part of everyday life? How much is it um, access and promotion? How much is it visible in the community? How much are kids seeing it where they go? Um, is there a low perception of harm? Do people understand what the harms are of use? And is, that, um, is it clear for kids particularly or for people that are at higher risk what those harms are? 
And then that idea of like delay, delay, delay. Early use leads to more problematic use. So in this slide, um, I, I have a little picture of, you probably recognize this part of Church Street. I don't know if you can see, it's a very grainy picture there uh, up on the screen. Um, but I, I put this because this is one of the kids in our youth groups. I took them out into the community and I said, tell me what you're seeing in the community in Burlington. And, um, and a couple of kids took some pictures of things that they saw. And one of the students who's here, um, she was walking up Church Street and noticed, hey, I'm walking home from school, or this is the way I would walk home from school. And like right here, I'm surrounded by places that sell substances. So there's things to think about. And, and these are things that like as adults sometimes kind of, I don't know, it just doesn't stick out to us always. You're not noticing it. I now notice these things everywhere I go. But before I got into prevention, I did not. So, um, so I challenge you to, uh, to look around your community and think about the things that kids might be seeing that you weren't noticing before. Um, this young lady who uh, noticed that we've got some places where um, it seems like substance use is maybe more prevalent than, than it actually is. Kids are seeing it as something that adults are doing a lot because of the way it kind of comes across in our community. Um, so we can create healthy strategies through things like equitable laws and policies and design of the community. We can plan for the community we want. Um, and creating opportunities for connection. If you want to switch to the next one. I also just want to, oh, I'm sorry, I will share this is also something that uh, kids oh, pre in previous years were talking about at Edmonds Middle School, thinking about there were 22 at the time, I just recently updated this uh, map, uh, tobacco retailers within a half mile of their school or within this, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, half mile blade radius of their school. And they were, uh, students were also noticing that a lot of the tobacco ads were really low on the, um, on the doors and the promotion. Um, so things to be thinking about, these were visuals that students were noticing that might be going, that we might not be paying as much attention to, but might be something for us to be looking at and thinking about as a community. But whatever we decide those things are that we want to push as the, the, the norm or the health in our commu uh, community, um, it also is important to enhance our protective factors. So I don't want to um, I don't want to uh, say that we can fix all of the all of the kind of issues that uh, a lot of us know that the community is experiencing around substance use without also supporting the things that build connection and and address the really uh, significant uh, issues. So if you switch, Mitch. Um, I will say that there are things beyond this kind of um, community normalization of use. There are larger societal issues that also impact substance use, right? And those things are important to acknowledge and also be doing work around. So these are different pieces of work that we can do at a community level thinking about um, uh, these are the types of risk factors that there's science and research behind that says that uh, they are connected to substance use in some way, whether a community uses. Um, not, this is not a list of anything to do with Burlington. It's just a list of the research. So there are things that we can be thinking about. How do we enhance connection for people? How do we support... Um, how do we support them through policy and practice? How do we support uh, folks that are struggling with really big... Um, where parts of our community that are struggling with really big issues around poverty and unemployment. Um, these are huge issues, but I think what is our biggest strength from the work that I've been doing in this community for a while is the people that continue to show up every day. I actually think that's like Burlington's superpower maybe, the, just the commitment and the compassion of the people that keep showing up collectively to do work together. Um, and um, one of those people is Cam Loff. Um, I want to give him a chance to come up and talk about how these, this environment that I'm talking about for youth um, being supported to make healthy decisions related to substance use is also an environment that supports adults at risk of misuse. Um, and I know a lot of folks in this community are working on that as well. Um, and so Cam's gonna come up and talk a little bit about that. He's the director of the Turning Point Recovery Center. Um, prevention recovery work is really closely linked. Um, and I'm really grateful to have the Turning Point Center in our community and to Cam for his collaboration. 
Um, I want to have him come up now and share a little bit more about his story and thoughts on a community where folks in recovery can also thrive. Hi, everybody. I'm Cam, um, I'm the executive director of the Turning Point Center of Chittenden County. Whoa. Um, hi, thanks. So a lot's been said, Mariah, thank you. Uh, you're my saving grace when it comes to prevention. Um, I must always be a student and be approachable to learning and understanding new concepts. My world is really narrowed right now as it's apparent uh, there's a heavy focus on uh, treatment, recovery, and I am humbled to be here. Thank you for asking me. I um, want to recognize everyone who's being awarded tonight because if not for your help in prevention, uh, recovery is even harder too. So just for example, um, what is it like recovering from substance use today in 2024 is very different than when it was 10 years ago, very different than 20 years ago, so on and so forth. But there are more outlets, there's more access, and there's more experiences that are shared. So I'm an individual who's in recovery from opiate use disorder, celebrated 10 years, uh, February 22nd. And if... <laughs> so had it not been for the city of Burlington, and moving to this city and feeling the community, feeling the real buy-in from everyone in there that everyone believed in me, that I wasn't just another statistic, I wasn't just another out-of-stater coming here for resources. Like, I was truly, desperately in need of care and guidance. And so the city had ample support available, education opportunities, a recovery center that's open 365 days a year, recovery-friendly workplaces. I didn't feel so singled out to um, you know, report all the gaps in my resume, and I felt accepted. Now, my use started at 12, and it progressed. It started with alcohol use, and then marijuana, nicotine, then eventually nicotine dependence, and you know, trying on some uh, recreational narcotics and eventually led to opiates. As that progressed over the years, I, reflecting now, 10 years being removed from, from use, I can put on the prevention hat sometimes, thanks to Mariah, thanks to this group, and start to assess how was substance use normalized for me growing up? How was it normalized in school? How was it normalized in my family? How susceptible was I to returning to use, too? And that's sort of another component. And at basically the, the main root of this discussion here that I'm going to talk about, not only is it one of the most challenging things to overcome physical dependence to any substance, use disorder, behavioral challenges that are associated with use, but to remain in recovery if not for these prevention efforts that are addressing the, the density of um, alcohol retailers, the, the frequency of the messaging that individuals in recovery are exposed to, the early stages of recovery, that first 30 days are so critical. It's the highest for potential of overdose, knowing that the tolerance for any opiate consumption is zero. And if someone is to return to use, possibly fatal. Now, while we're all here and we're supporting prevention efforts, we're equally supporting individuals that are 30 days sober, that are one day sober, or they just got started on medications, or they just got started on treatment. We're helping them get a leg up and then still providing for that same community feel that I benefited from so many years ago. So appreciation for this community. It isn't just in silos. If you look at the continuum of substance use, there's prevention and treatment, then recovery, but we're all one. 
Recovery has its role in prevention and treatment, obviously recovery, as does prevention in the other two, as does treatment in the other two. So you can see it's, it's breaking down these silos and we've grown so much as a community that we have these innovation pro innovative programs like CRT. We've got committed uh, volunteers, community members, people dedicated to this work, dedicated for their neighbors in making healthier choices more accessible. So thank you all so much. Thank you so much, Kim. I think it, um, hopefully we'll have a chance tonight to hear from lots of folks talking about how their little piece of the puzzle is impacting the world and the community that they're in. And I really just appreciate um, all the people doing their part and, and partners like uh, the Turning Point Center for the work that we can do collaboratively together and for Kim for sharing his story. Um, so, um, I think now we're just going to take a little bit of a break. So we're back together again. I am really excited to kick off this next section in which we'll um, hear a little bit from another community member and then also about some of the people receiving awards today. Um, the next person I'm going to invite up, who some of you know um, as a resident and mother in the Burlington community, as a storyteller, she creates heart-centered spaces through live performance, interactive workshops, and community engagements. So thank you for joining us today, Fareen Paris. Hello, hello, hello. Um, thank you, Mariah. Thank you for being committed to the purpose. Thank you for reminding us how to love the mission of this work. For those who do not know me, my name is Fareen Paris. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the founder of a storytelling organization called All Heart Inspirations. She actually turns four this weekend. And she started in the wake of so many things. 2020, in the wake of racial uprisings, in the wake of George Floyd, in the wake of Breonna Taylor, but also in the wake of connections being canceled, in the wake of COVID when all of the sudden it was like, where are my communities? Where are my people? I'm reflecting on those tenets you had on the screen. I'm thinking about some of my dark moments during COVID, not having access to humanity, to hearts, and what that can do to make you to try to numb or not sit in the reality of what life is holding. But I'm here and as a storyteller, I tried to ask myself, what is this purpose I can have in this community? And for me, as I was reflecting with Sal, a new friend that I literally just made at this table, talking about how many of us are just wanting people to see our humanity. I've been looking at the logo for Burlington Partnership, and I'm looking at these set of hands. I'm Haitian, I'm of Haitian ancestry. I am from the magical country of Haiti, one of the first black republics to kick out their colonizers and say, no more. Before Rosa said no, Haiti was one of the first countries to say no. And this weekend is our Haitian Flag Day. And looking at this logo and looking at these hands, it reminds me of a proverb that is very much alive in our culture. And it's, me apil shai palu. With many hands, the load is lighter. And kind of circling back to what Sal and I were talking about and what Barb, I don't know where you are, Barb, in this room, there you are, another award recipient, what we were talking about. I think many of us are trying to do good work. I don't always get it right. It's not always a slam dunk. Sometimes it's just a fumble because I am also human. I am also human and black and raising two daughters and trying to do this thing called life like the rest of us. But in this moment, I do not want to deny that 
the us that are taking up seats in this room, that we are adding to the collective this idea of with many hands, the load can be lighter, right? What can this community be without Barb doing their magic in the community that they're a part of? What would my daughter Nala be without Mukhtar as her amazing soccer coach? When I look at this pamphlet and I'm reading the stories and I'm like, I know some of these people. I know some of this work that they're doing. It makes me feel like I'm leaning towards where the universe and the ancestors want me to lean because it makes such a profound difference. It makes such a profound difference for my multiracial black daughter to see representation finally in an educator. Do you know what that does? And that is why she feels so confident, able to kick goals from half court and being like, whether it lands or not, it doesn't question my worth because I have been seen and empowered by people who believe in me. So I'm trying to ask us, last week I was speaking at the Vermont Businesses for Social Responsibility, and the theme for that conference was, it's in our hands. I'm seeing a metaphor coming back to me in the last week, hands, hands. This is reminding me, if you're familiar with Grey's Anatomy, Meredith Grey, pick me, choose me, love me. And while she was doing it for Dr. McDreamy, and it felt really annoying when I watched that episode, tell me what human in this room doesn't want to put your hand up because you're advocating for what your child needs, because you're navigating a, a dark moment, because the world has flipped you on your back again for the hundredth time, that you're an educator in Burlington being asked to be a unicorn while resources are limited. Who doesn't want to be picked? to be loved, to be seen. And I'm trying to invite us to realize, just like Barb and just like Mukhtar, we as individuals, even though it is, was that first tenant at the bottom, Mariah, I want to believe that I, if I lean into my gifts, I can make a difference. And I see that in this community. I see that as I look out into this room, right? We are so much more than what is the canvas that people see when we walk into a space. You know, like Joe, I'm sitting in this room and I'm reflecting on one of my hardest moments when a resolution did not get voted in this room and what it meant for me and Joe to have a human moment across the border and being like, I know you're trying, but I, I'm just, so, I'm upset. And he's like, I know for me. And having that human moment, Nothing got solved. The resolution didn't get approved because me and Joe had a moment, but we stopped and we saw each other. What are we doing to stop and see each other? What are we doing to use this muscle within our chest that is more than just pumping blood through our souls? The heart is more than just giving oxygen to our bodies. It is our North Star. And if we don't do our internal work, if we don't commit to our healing, and if we don't commit to where we need to do better, or where we need to like shine more in our gifts because it will be deposits to this community, then if this starts to get toxic, then what we put out is toxic. So actually one of the things in regards to navigating this idea around substances, when I think about some of the harder moments that I've had, I needed someone to just simply pick me, choose me, love me. And we actually can bring that so seamlessly into all the different parts that we are connected to. Q can do it as the director for athletics for, for our students, right? You're doing it as a coach. You are literally by the side of our mayor working, making sure that we actually can start doing some of the change that we need as a community, we are actually capable of so much. We as individuals are capable of so much. So I invite you, as we celebrate the honorees today, as we hear from the people who took the time to slow down and see their contributions, see their deposits, I want to believe each of these can be deposited into the collective well that we need to deeply start doing the work to repair and heal 
this community because it means something. It means something. It means something. Thank you. Thank you so much, Farine. I, um, I, we needed that energy back after all, uh, um, all of our break to come back into this space and think about why we're all here together. And I really appreciate you bringing that back to us. And I think it's a great start to the next um, heart-filling part of our uh, event, which is where we get to talk about the awesome people doing wonderful things in this community. Um, before the break, we, and actually I'm going to ask as we, uh, Vareen has the energy that needs to come out here and be with all of you, but for the rest of the folks, I'll ask you to speak into this mic because right here we have a mic, uh, CCTV is, um, uh, is uh, taping this for the folks who can't be in the room today so that the folks who have loved ones that want to watch later can do that through CCTV and that'll be available on their website. Um, and so the closer you are to this microphone, the more they can catch for that video. Um, I, um, before the break, we focused a lot on BPHC and the work that we're doing and other partners that are related to our mission of preventing substance misuse. And now we get to focus on the people and the organizations that are here in Burlington supporting a thriving community. Um, and making the work that uh, organizations like the Burlington Partnership and the Turning Point Recovery Center, making that work easier for us. Um, each year we receive nominations for people in lots of people in programs doing great, amazing work. Um, usually they're doing it without much recognition just because it's needed. Um, and I say this every year and I think I've probably already said it earlier this evening, but um, our real success in having or getting to the place of having a healthy community that we can all be really proud of um, will be to increase and enhance those strengths and positive influences that our community already has. So this, those people and the programs in this room that are doing that important work is helping create a layer of protection um, it, that creates connection and support and access to health that helps us reduce substance use issues. These people and, um, and people like them are the strengths in Burlington that will help us get to where we all want to be. Um, oops, sorry, I lost my page here. Hold on a second. Okay. Um, so some of those, those strengths that Burlington has are people like Barbara and Ellie and Mukhtar and Angela and the community response team. Um, they were all nominated by people in the community, like Farin said, um, because people saw their, them as examples of our community's strengths. Um, sometimes, like Mukhtar, people are working with young people to build their confidence and their character and, um, and support them through activities that they're passionate about. Sometimes, like Barbara, they're working to build community between people around them and transforming our disconnected culture into a healthier, supportive one within your own environment. Um, like Angela, sometimes their, their friendly face brightens each time a child comes into the room to show kids that adults care about them and that there are safe places to get support. Um, or like the community response team, they're, people are noticing people in need, and instead of leaving it for someone else to deal with, they say, let us help. So we'll all help share the load. Um, um, and, oh, let us help, <laughs> and we'll help share the load. Um, and then there are people like Dr. Ellie Farisi who use their professional experience and their power to bring attention to important community issues and connect more people to information to make healthy choices. Um, today's awardees are helping plant little prevention seedlings in our community. This is where our theme comes in. Each of them is an individual tree that supports the limbs and leaves that they're connected to. Um, but for them and for all of us, 
As there are more trees supporting healthy individuals and healthy policies and practices in the community, the gaps between each of our trees get smaller. Together as a forest, we're stronger than any one individual tree, and we provide an environment in which everyone can flourish. So join me in a round of applause for the 2024 Roots of Prevention awardees and all they've done to build roots for the community. So our first award that we're going to talk about today is for an outstanding individual in our community, Barbara Tyler. Um, and Antoinette Bennett-Jones is going to come up and speak about her. Hi, everyone. So I want to take some words from Farine and say, let me slow down for a minute and tell you about my friend Barbara. Barbara is a valuable member of the Laurentide community and the community of Burlington. Barbara supports the community in every aspect she can possibly think of. When I asked a few people about Barbara, a lot of the words jumped out at me. She's a supporter. She's a believer. She listens when I need someone to listen to me. And we can knock on her door anytime we want. Barbara and Lori attended a 10-week program called the BLBC, which is Building Lives and Building Community. It was a program that was geared to creating uh, residential leaders. One thing that stood out about me that many of the members talked about was Barbara's unwavering ability to d distribute food and help those that were in need of food and support. Some of the other things were she's very nice, she's very friendly. I met Barbara one time before tonight, and just that discussion I had with her felt like I've known her for a lifetime. So I just want you guys to help me congratulate Barbara in receiving this, this award tonight. So in a minute, I'm going to um, invite someone to come up and speak about another outstanding individual in our community. This is one that I also know and wanted to add a little to. Dr. Ellie Ferrissey is someone that um, I was saying to them earlier this evening that I uh, rely on uh, for our organization. Dr. Ellie has been doing their hard work the last couple years of trying to make sure that folks in our community understand the issues around vaping that are impacting health for young people. Um, and we've called on them a lot to, uh, and they've said yes to pretty much everything, to be part of a video, to be uh, do an Instagram live, um, to go to the state house and educate legislators, to come to the community and talk um, at events. And so um, I think, and uh, probably for many reasons, but one, uh, because they are in a position to know about those things, and when you know um, the, the challenge, I think, for all of us that do this work and that learn this kind of information is that we also have to um, take responsibility and make sure that we share that with others. Um, and, um, and Dr. Farisi has really um, done that, I think I'm going to speak for them a little bit to say because they are also a part of this community, a Burlington resident and also someone with knowledge and information to share. So I appreciate uh, both as a resident of Burlington uh, helping support that information for our community as well as, um, as, well as someone uh, that works in the healthcare system. Um, so I'm going to invite 
um, Rebecca McRae to come up and speak about Dr. Farisi and give them the Outstanding Individual Award. Hello, everyone. So I first met Dr. Ellie Farisi on a Zoom meeting during the early days of COVID. Ellie was then and is now an attending physician in the pediatric pulmonology department at UVM Medical Center. We were on a Zoom call where Ellie was answering questions about COVID and its impact on kids with pulmonary diagnoses and disorders. And I honestly don't remember any other details of the meeting because we had a lot of Zoom meetings at the beginning of COVID to learn rapidly about this new disease. But what I was left with was an impression from Ellie, which translated in my brain as, wow, this person is not only knowledgeable, but really cool, really edgy. And this is someone I need to be friends with. So since that introductory meeting, I've learned firsthand that Ellie is a champion for her adolescent patients, as well as a strong advocate around educating parents, educators, students, and our lawmakers about the importance of prevention because vaping is so addictive and dangerous. I have had the pleasure also of partnering with Dr. Ferrisi in organizing a few presentations. First, in the first school year without COVID protocols and masks, we partnered to organize a parent education night in the Burlington School District about the best ways to teach about vapes. What's in them? How addictive are they? What are the best ways to talk to your kids about them? Ellie not only shared expertise on the matter with parents, but their experience in working with teens who honestly think vaping is a popular fad that they can control, instead of the reality that the vape and what's inside controls the body. At the time of this presentation, Ellie was leading the Vermont Child Health Improvement Project around vaping and lung health. We thought that the Burlington School District Parent Educational Night, we thought of that as a pilot for something that could be bigger and we could offer it to other um, districts across Vermont. We videotaped and live streamed the presentation um, that Ellie gave at Hunt Middle School Auditorium. And even though there were only 10 parents in the audience, we honestly don't know how many people actually watched it after the fact on public television, on Facebook, or what greater impact it truly had. However, like all advocacy work, we showed up, we offered the presentation, and the ideas and enthusiasm that Ellie brought to the cause made a difference to those who received the information. Ellie was also generous to receive my invitation to speak at the Vermont State School Nurses Association 2023 Spring Conference around vapes and vaping. This was a hot topic after COVID because all of a sudden it seemed like vaping just took over as the next pandemic in our schools. School nurses were so impressed by Ellie's knowledge and excited to gain ideas on how to help kids on the ground daily, both in their addiction and in the prevention of kids from using in the first place. Ellie is an engaging speaker to learn from and leaves audiences ready to make change where they can. I was this close to signing up for the Tobacco Treatment and Prevention Conference being held in Portland, Maine, but I can't go. It's June 4th and 5th, but I was super excited to find out that the pre-conference speaker is none other than Ellie Farisi, <laughs> speaking on supporting healthy decisions around youth vaping. This is an indicator to me that Dr. Ellie Farisi is no longer just a Vermont known expert. She is becoming a regionally renowned speaker. Congratulations on that note. <laughs> I was not the only person that nominated Dr. Farisi for this award, and I'd like to share a few words with you from Lauren Tien, who is a medical student who worked closely with Dr. Farisi. I also learned more about Dr. Farisi's advocacy that work outside of pulmonology um, through reading uh, Lauren's nomination form. Her form nominated Dr. Farisi's passion to increase exposure to careers in medicine for students of un underrepresented backgrounds. 
Through a program at UVM called Pathways to Pediatrics, Ellie spearheads the coordination to bring undergraduates to UVM for a full day of hands-on activities, small group discussions, and interactions with Lerner College of Medicine faculty. Lauren Tian wrote, Dr. Ferrissey's work to excite students and open their world of opportunities is invaluable. It is the exact outreach UVM needs to take initiative on take initiative on to diversify our health professionals and give hope to students who previously may not have seen careers in health professions as attainable options. My one word description of Dr. Pharisee is inspiring. Not only does she use her limited time and energy to inspire undergraduates to pursue health careers, but she has inspired me, a current medical student who is already on a path. Medical students often enter the field with dreams of saving the world and delivering justice. We are quickly brought back down to earth upon learning of the rigors and exhaustion of working in medicine. Dr. Pharisee showed me that it's possible to be an incredible clinician and public policy advocate without losing yourself. Dr. Pharisee is the doctor every young child thinks of when they idolize what kind of doctor they want to be. I am fortunate not only to know Dr. Pharisee, but that they know me and continually check in to see how I am progressing in my career. I hope to be half the doctor Dr. Pharisee is one day. Specifically for the Burlington community, it's harder to find a physician more dedicated to promoting health and wellness than Dr. Pharisee. With the limited time, free time you'd expect to have as a pediatric pulmonologist, I have witnessed Dr. Pharisee work tirelessly in public policy and advocacy. I can't quantify how many patients Dr. Pharisee has treated, but one can only imagine the stress of treating children with respiratory issues during a pandemic of respiratory symptoms. Dr. Pharisee balances her clinical and advocacy work with grace and never lets attention fall to the wayside on either. Outside of clinical work, Dr. Pharisee has championed removing sale of flavored tobacco products in Vermont. As a pediatric pulmonologist, Dr. Pharisee witnesses firsthand every day the consequences of young Vermonters becoming addicted to these harmful substances. After six years of legislative debate and countless speaking engagements on local television networks, at high schools, and more, Bill S-18 passed the Vermont House on March 14th and will move next to the Senate. This is significant progress and one step forward in Dr. Pharisee's tire tireless efforts to protect our children. As Lauren said, Dr. Pharisee has been a fierce advocate for many years for Bill S-18. Sadly, the bill was vetoed by our governor, but I want to highlight the impact that Dr. Pharisee has had as a leader among legislative testimony. Many school nurses thought that this flavor ban bill would pass because it seemed like a no-brainer, because especially if Ellie Pharisee, the expert on the impact vapes have on our youth was testifying, then of course it will pass. We believe that if anyone could convince the lawmakers in Montpelier, Ellie would. And in reality, Ellie, you did, because it passed both the House and the Senate. I'm so proud that we had you representing what is best for adolescent health in these hearings, and I do believe that you and your impact will ultimately change the landscape of youth, youth vaping in Vermont. As a school nurse, I am honored to have met Dr. Ellie Farisi. I'm excited to speak on behalf of all those that you have made a difference for. School nurses, undergraduates, medical students, parents, your patients, and individuals whom you may never know. Your contributions as an outstanding individual and the partnership you've created make Burlington a healthier community. Congratulations and a sincere thank you. You have to take the picture when people come up because it's too hard to gather everyone afterwards. So <laughs> bear with us as we take our, have our photograph moment. 
Um, I next I would love to invite um, to come up um, Elzi Wick and Mahat Abdullahi to speak about Mukhtar Abdullahi uh, receiving the Youth and Families Award. All right, my leg fell asleep at the wrong time. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Mahat Abdullahi. Um, grateful, and it's an honor to be here uh, speaking on behalf of my brother today. Had I known that he was going to ask me to speak, I would not have nominated him. <laughs> Seriously. But thank you, and, and congrats to you. I just want to kind of uh, touch on a couple of stories anecdotally um, related to where we come from, who we are, and, um, and what makes Mukhtar a champion of this, of this community and a champion of prevention. So we're both born in, in Somalia. He's, um, uh, he's about 10 months older than me. I'm still mad about that. Um, and we, we lived in a refugee camp in, in Kenya. And, and prior to that, we lived in a very rural uh, part of Kenya. And I remember one day, uh, we're walking to, to school. See, I can't get this story straight, uh, straight. And I had to talk to him about it earlier because... At the time, uh, I believe we were six and seven. So I, I was like, hey, man, let me, get, let me get this story. Let me get this story straight. Were we coming back from school or were we going to school? He's like, no, no, we're going to school. So I'm like, all right. So we're going to school. And the problem is <clears throat> there's a river between the school and, and where we live. And it's relatively close. It's uh, probably, say, a couple of miles. And so on our way there, we see a couple of um, uh, wild dogs. And for those of you that... that um, don't know what, what those look like. They're essentially hyena-looking dogs. They're about, I'd say, the same size, maybe a little bit taller, just as vicious. And so we're walking there, and I'm like, hey, man, you see that? He's like, yeah. What do we do? And so he grabs my hand, and he just books it back home. And, and my mom at the time, she's praying, and she could, she could see it all unfolding, but, um, you know, to kind of um, wrap, wrap up on that, on that bit of the story, we made it. We're here, <laughs> and 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 it, it's it's kind of what 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 builds you know that that strength that character uh, and <clears throat> and then I'll you know I'll share another bit about growing up in in the refugee camp. You know a lot of a lot of folks when we talk to them they kind of um, maybe see it as well. That must have been hard, and it's like no, it hasn't. It's not hard, um, and the reason why is <clears throat> and it's so nice to have to have my mom here, and she's. Um, She's, she's the strength that, that, that carries us through. And, um, you know, just a quick bit is, you know, we, we would run out of, you know, sugar or cooking oil or whatever, and she'd say, hey, can you go to the neighbor and grab some? Yep. Boom. Go, go to the neighbor. Hey, my mom said. And you would ask very nicely, my mom said, no, 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 no. And then the neighbor would be like, yep. <clears throat> and then so you go, you come back, you bring, you bring whatever, whatever your mom asked you. The next day, the next week, whatever, the neighbor's son, daughter, they come over and they say, hey, my mom said, da, da, da. And then, so it, you kind of, that's, that's what makes a community a community. And that's the kind of background we come from and we know what it takes. Um, we know what it took to get, to get us uh, to, uh, to grow up in, in difficulty. And when we, when we came to, to the United States, you know, Mukhtar's picked up everything. He's, he's, um, he's, a, he's, a, he's a football coach, proper football. Uh, he's a, a, a uh, linguistic liaison at, at Winooski. Uh, serving youth and, and their families and building the bridge between the educators and, and those families. He's a prevention educator at Winooski Partnership for Prevention. He's a coach of boys and girls. And, and I just, it's, I could say so much more. And it's just an honor to be, uh, to be your brother. And, and thank you for, for your leadership and for being the, uh, the father figure that you are in our family. Sorry, you weren't going to hear me if this was up higher. 
Um, so I am honored and delighted to be here to help introduce Mukhtar, who's the recipient of the Youth and Families Award. Um, his passion for the beautiful game of soccer or football um, has shaped countless athletes and inspired communities far and wide. Mukhtar has made quite a mark in the soccer community. When he and his brother Mahat moved to the US from Kenya and landed in Vermont as 10 and 11 year olds, they continued finding joy in the game of soccer and the impact it can have in life. As Mahat said to me recently, once you have soccer, you don't put it down. They both played as they grew up. Mukhtar played a bit in high school, a bit, um, and later in college while receiving a bachelor's degree in psychology and human services. And while playing, <clears throat> excuse me, brought fun and competition, the two brothers discovered how coaching enabled them to inspire others to not only love the game as they do, but to take that passion into other areas of life, much like Mahat just shared. In Mukhtar, we find someone who embodies the true spirit of soccer, a sport that transcends boundaries, unites cultures, and fosters lifelong bonds. <clears throat> uh, Mukhtar has been a coach for Burlington FC, which is a local community soccer club, for five years. He's currently coaching the U12 girls and U16 girls. He's also played for and coached the Juba Star uh, Adult League, where the majority of Juba's players are immigrants or former refugees from African nations, including Somalia, Kenya, and Burundi. And then two years ago, the Burlington High School boys soccer team needed a new coach. The previous coach retired after many, many, many years. And uh, finding a replacement for such a talented and diverse team was a big deal. And the school received a number of qualified applicants. But ultimately, Q Pinckney, our district athletic director knew that Mukhtar would be the team's next leader. As he shared with me, uh, Mukhtar is the embodiment of what we look for in our Burlington School District coaches. Someone who is approachable, relatable to our student athletes, and not only passionate about the game of soccer, football, uh, but more importantly, passionate about making student athletes better players and even better people. Demonstrating those qualities during our hiring process, it quickly became apparent that he would be the right person to lead our boys' soccer program. In his short time, Mukhtar has already gotten our team to within a goal of a state championship berth, and his impact reaches the entire Burlington area, and we hope to have him around. I'll stress this. We hope to have him around for a very long time as he continues to model what strong citizenship looks like both on and off the field. And as one of his BHS boys soccer team players shared with me, and a lot of them wanted to share with me, I had to, I had to filter it just to, to fit it in tonight. But Mukhtar cares about each player personally, not just the team, but he gets to know each player on a more personal level. He brings heart and grit to the game, and he knows how to make the team work hard while keeping it fun and positive. He's more than just a coach, he's a friend and a positive role model. And then one of the girls on his BFCU 16 team shared with me that Mukhtar is a great coach because he has a deep understanding of the game and knows how to bring out the best in his players. He is dedicated, supportive, and always pushes our team to reach our full potential. And he cares deeply about his players and can connect with each player on a personal level. He always goes above and beyond to make each and every one of us dedicated to our team and has helped foster my love of soccer. We love Mukhtar. And personally, as a parent of players, I want to share how grateful I am that my kids have the opportunity to learn so much about themselves, both as soccer players and as individuals under the tutelage of Coach Mukhtar. Mukhtar strives to develop young athletes into great players, and perhaps more importantly, he inspires them to be good citizens and people, and to use good judgment, make good choices, and to be, as he is, positive forces in the community. So tonight we honor Mukhtar for his outstanding contributions to youth and families in this community, and included in that, the world of soccer. 
please join me in congratulating Mukhtar on this well-deserved recognition and thank him for his unparalleled dedication to the beautiful game and for so actively and selflessly giving his time, energy, and love to our community. And I want to just, wait, can I go totally off script for one thing? I just want to add one thing, that if we could bottle the love and admiration and respect that these two brothers have for each other, and somehow sprinkle it in the city water, <laughs> so many of the tensions would be gone. So, yeah, you guys are wonderful. So this year we also have an outstanding program. Um, and Ashley Bond and Joe McGee are gonna come up and speak about the fire department's community response team. Good evening, everyone. My name is Joe McGee. I uh, formerly served on the Burlington City Council and I am now the Deputy Chief of Staff for Mayor Mulvaney Stanek. And I am very proud to be joining you all tonight. Uh, congratulations to all of the award recipients tonight. Uh, and I'm especially proud to be uh, here with Ashley to present the, uh, this award to the community response team and the members of the Burlington Fire Department. Uh, I'll start with a personal note as to why this night is meaningful to me and uh, why I nominated the community response team, part of the reason why I nominated the community response team for this work. Um, my family has a rich history of public service. I had a grandfather who was a Boston firefighter, uh, and my father was a Boston police officer who was injured in the line of duty and suffered with uh, substance use disorder. When I joined the city council, it was important to me uh, to make an effort to build connections with our first responders. And uh, I was able to connect with uh, Union President Kyle Blake. And uh, we were able to build a strong relationship. And that was really important to me as, uh, as a member of the city council being connected to the first responders, but also to let them know at a time when so many challenges were facing our community, especially with public health, that they had uh, support from elected leaders. The overdose crisis reached an unprecedented height last summer, and so did the calls for service coming to the fire department related to overdoses. The spike was not entirely unexpected as overdose rates and overdose fatalities had risen precipitously in the years since the pandemic. Responding to each of these calls for service were members of the Burlington Fire Department. Every firefighter you talk to is clear-eyed clear, clear -eyed in their view of the mission. If a call for help comes in, firefighters are there and they show up. It was no different last summer when the calls related to overdoses just kept coming. At one point in a 48-hour period, they responded to more than 50 reported overdoses across the city of Burlington. It was during that period of time that members of the fire department, backed up by Fire Chief Mike LeChance, said that they could do this differently, that they could pursue a different model for responding to the overdose crisis in our community. And with that, they stood up the community response team in a mere matter of weeks, standing up a different model, piloting a program, and uh, showing compassion, meeting people where they were at, and we have seen the impact of that with a fall in overdose fatalities over the last year. Uh, finally, after years of overdoses rising, overdose fatalities rising, we saw a plateau 
in uh, 2023. And that is due in no small part to the work of the community response team and their adapting to meet the challenges in our community. And uh, Ashley's gonna talk a little bit more about the work that they've done and how they pulled it off. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff. Um, as he stated, um, you know, there was, we were at an epidemic, pandemic, really crisis mode last year. And I'm here to celebrate the unity in the community where the community is in the fire department itself. So there, last summer in this crisis time, there were a lot of stakeholders at the table wanting to participate in how we could make a system or a program to address the opioid uh, epidemic. Perfection can sometimes be the enemy of the good, and there was really not a lot of traction uh, ha coming along with that process. And so where that unity in the community of the fire department in Burlington came together was for them to come together and say, what can we do with the resources that we have? What would the program goals be and how would they be measured? How can we measure that? And how would this pilot program impact the department? What emerged out of that collaborative work session is this community response team. They respond to dispatch calls and are ready to deliver care for suspected overdoses. And when they respond to that dispatch call, they determine the level of escalation that, can, that is required. If no escalation is required, they provide the care that's needed at the time, including wound care kits, Narcan leave-behind kits, and connections and resources to the, to the community resources out there that are available to them. This initial response and ability to escalate when needed has created a place where the Burlington Fire Department is meeting individuals and respecting where they are in their life and in their journey and not forcing them to be where we want them to be. While we recognize the community response team is one of many resources out there and many people out there doing the good work, the data reflects that this program is working. So as we mentioned, this, this pilot program was kicked off in October of last year, and immediately we were seeing an average of 25% reduction in overdoses in our community, and we have been ever since then, so it's working. And while you likely see the firefighters traveling on foot or in a passenger vehicle who are part of this community response team, what you may not know is that every firefighter working a shift on this community response team is doing so by way of voluntary overtime. For a department that already has mandatory overtime and a department where shifts take them away from their families for four days at a time, the commitment and support for this program by the Burlington firefighters is something we should all be proud of and thankful for. So be, on behalf of the Burlington Fire Commission, it is my pleasure to share with you the bold initiatives of this collaborative approach of the Burlington Fire Department, and along with the Burlington Partnership for a Healthy Community, rec recognize and present the Roots of Preven Prevention Outstanding Program Award to the entire team of the Burlington Fire Department for developing the community response team. All right, everybody from the fire department, come on up. You all have to come. It'll be like half the room. Oh, right behind you. <laughs> wait, Evan, wait. Come on. Come oh, on okay. <laughs>
we're down to, um, okay, I wanted to make sure I said that correct. We're down to our last award. <laughs> um, our next award is the D.G. Weaver Award. Um, so uh, we started this award back in the beginning of um, our um, beginning of this Roots of Prevention Award celebration. Um, we do it in, to honor a late assistant principal of Burlington High School, D.G. Weaver, um, uh, by giving this award to a person associated with the Burlington schools who, like Mr. Weaver, is a positive role model who goes above and beyond to support healthy opportunities and activities for our youth in the community, either as a staff or as a volunteer, um, in the community or as administration. I uh, never met DG, but when we started organizing this celebration years ago, community, many community members talked to us about the dedication he had to supporting kids in this school district and creating healthy opportunities for them. Um, and we're really grateful for his, to his family for letting us um, honor him in this um, in this award and his memory in this way. One of his family members is here today, Peggy Weaver, um, to honor the awardee who's receiving the award tonight. Um, so um, what's really great, I think, about uh, you know getting to read the nominations for this award is so often I'm excited to see people that I know in the community that we've had the pleasure of getting to, um, to work with and to know that all of the people in the community are also appreciating those folks. Um, and Angela Halstead is one of those people we work really closely with and I'm really excited to have people come up and talk about all the things I already know about her that are so awesome. Um, so uh, I'd like to invite Pat Holbert and Ren Harbert to come up and speak about Angela Halstead. And clearly Angela didn't read the uh, program because she didn't even know who was going to talk about her. Um, sure. Um, hi guys. I'm here today to talk about Miss Angela. Miss Angela is one of the most kind, compassionate, and supportive people in my life. I've never seen her on the hallways without a smile or a positive attitude, and she's always had her office opens to anyone who needed her and anyone who wanted her, really. <laughs> Not that she isn't needed. Believe me, she is. She does so much for our school and our community that goes unseen. That's why I'm so beyond grateful and excited that she's here and getting honored for even some of the work she's done. Seriously, she is so amazing that, like, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to believe. She's constantly bringing our school community together in fun and exciting ways and is always sharing her resources with anyone who needs them or wants them and also always keeps pretzel sticks in her like office which I really appreciate because I get hungry guys <laughs> forgive me but she's so incredible and I'm so lucky to have her in my life because she's been there for me for the good the great and the bad the really not great. Um, I only met Miss Angela this year, and already the impact she's had on my life will last for the rest of it. She's so kind and so caring, and I hope to be half the person she is and help half the amount of people she has when I grow up. She's really just my inspiration and my guidance in life. And I would not be who I am today without her. And I know I've only known her for a short time, but from the moment we got stuck de decorating the school dance, just the two of us, I have had so much respect and love for her. And I will never admire someone as much as I've admired Miss Angela. And I will always, always have an overwhelming sense of like, admiration for you. So I just, I consider you to be a teacher and someone I can go to for guidance, but I also consider you to be one of my closest friends. And I love you so much, it's like unfathomable. So thank you all so much. <laughs> So 
So I'm Pat. I work right next door to Angela in our offices. And when, I, when Mariah asked if someone could speak on Angela's behalf, I was like, mm, yeah, I can do it. And then I started writing something down, and then I told myself, nope, nope, it has to be short and sweet, because I didn't want to cry. <laughs> and right now, I'm so glad that I didn't do that speech, because I don't think we could get through it. So Angela, my love, you could look up many words in the dictionary and still wouldn't find all the words to describe Angela. Her name should be in there, with a big heart and sunshine. She brings so much laughter to us, even on the hard days. I have the pleasure of working with her for many years, know about her family, birthdays, colds, and what is happening with Delaney's college adventures. We are more than co-workers, we're family. The students, staff, and families all feel the same way about Angela. There's nothing she can't tackle. Wow, we are so lucky to be with her. I get texts from her when she isn't at school to make sure I check on a st certain student because she's worried about them. And I go do what she asks of me. And it really means a lot to the students that I check in with because she's special in their lives. She matters. And then the students and staff miss her when she's not here. They stop by for one of her pretzels. <laughs> and a smile, and words of encouragement to get through the day. A big thank you to Angela for all you do for Edmonds community. We are so appreciative of you. You, always, you will always be our sunshine filled with love and laughter. If I had one wish for everyone, it would be to be lucky enough to have an Angela in your life. And I'm going to end this because... Um, with a, a quote a student wrote. We have no idea, Angela, who wrote this. Found it in Stephen Boyle's class. But it says, Miss Angela isn't my rock. She is my river. She's always there to help wash away the bad. Congratulations, Angela. I just need to say a couple things. God, I don't know why I'm doing this. This is ridiculous, Stephen. I don't know. This is the kind of work you just can't do alone. So there's no way I am receiving this award today. Um, this award will be shared. I have got my former like clinical supervisors here from BHS from like 1998. <laughs> Jan Schamberger and Peggy Weaver from Hunt was another supervisor. Kate Paxton, who's like the liaison to central office, Becca McCray leading the way with health and wellness. My family, um, Heather Washburn from BHS, who's doing the work I do at Edmonds and Pat Holbert, our whole guidance staff, like we all wrap students, we work together. Um, super important in this field to just leave your ego aside because there's just no way to like own all this on your own. Um, and this one right here, oh my God. REN rep represents our Be Above group. It's a prevention group. We have over 30 kids that are in this prevention club, and we're just about spreading good vibes, wellness, fun, um, and joy. But oh my God, these are the, it's Ren who's doing like the actual, the work, the groundwork, um, and inspiring so many other kids. And we find that our kids, they have told me the reason why I'm in Be Above is to keep myself safe because there are so many temptations out there. So I'm really proud of the work Ren and all our other students are doing, and we only help to just keep building and growing. Um, but I need to share this, and if I forget any of other, my other people in this room, um, I just, I love you all dearly. So thank you so much. And Mariah, oh my God, Mariah. Let's just give a wrap, right? Like, such an unsung 
hero. So I'm grateful to Mariah and the partnership as well. So how are we all feeling? Ooh, there we go. This, we've broken it. It just wants to keep popping off. Um, hopefully you are getting the same vibe after smiling at your table at the beginning of the event. Um, hearing all of the good work that everybody's doing always leaves me with more strength and readiness for the work ahead um, when we leave this room. And I hope it does for all of you too. Um, so this event is about the awardees, and we're going to wrap up, but I do want to bring your attention to a few things our coalition is doing that you might be interested in. One of those is, um, I mentioned earlier, we have a parenting program called Parent In. We are doing a virtual screening of screenagers under the influence next week, um, which you can watch and then participate in a live uh, discussion with a few local folks who know, uh, who can answer some questions. Um, and one of those is Angela Halstead, because good people keep doing good things. So you can see her again next week um, if you come to the screening. And I think somewhere in this room you can, uh, yes, there's a poster over there where you can, uh, with a little QR code to uh, register if you'd like, or just go to our website. Um, and you saw, I'm sure, hopefully, you read some of the things on your table. Um, there's lots of ways to get involved in this work. If you're interested in substance use prevention and want to know more about how to collaborate, please do reach out to us. We're always um, trying to bring in new partners, think about more creative ways, listen to voices that we haven't um, that we're not bring we haven't brought in yet. Um, so maybe your voice is one of those that we need to hear more from. Um, and I didn't mention this at the beginning of the day, at the event, and I meant to. Uh, I'm sure you all have seen, but. There, you know, we're trying to save paper and not print out programs for everybody, but um, there's a lot of great information about the work that the awardees today are doing that are in our virtual program that you can scan from uh, what's at your desk. So if, if you heard someone speaking about them today and you thought, I want to know more about that, we've got a little bit more in that program. Or reach out to them. Um, so supporting prevention comes in many forms, and like our awardees, um, sometimes, like our awardees, it's the donation of your time and expertise, and others with financial resources sometimes donate funds that can have a profound impact on the outcomes of the community. Um, and so I want to say a giant thank you to our generous sponsors for today's event. We always host this, oh, this celebration free to anyone who can, um, so that anyone can come but it does cost money to be able to host it, and we've been so lucky to have folks that help fund that for us. Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is one of those. They've been supporting this for many years, this event for many years, helping us ensure that we can truly make this a community event with no cost to attend. Board chair, our board chair, Megan Peak from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont is in the back over there. You've probably seen her doing all the work um, over at the tables, and I wanna thank her. She shows up every year to help with us. Uh, help us with this event um, and supporting our connection with Blue Cross Blue Shield. We're also really grateful for to the United Way of Northwest Vermont who provided financial support for this event this year. They've joined in the all-in approach to prevention in the last few years in a way that um, we're really grateful for in every day of our work. Um, and Sugar Snap generously donated all of the food today, as well as their time to make all of the food today, which I think is the biggest part of the donation because that takes a lot of work. Um, so we're very grateful to them. Hopefully it was delicious. Um, and um, that is a huge lift from them. So we were very over the moon to have that support this year. I also just wanted to say a few other thank yous. Um, for folks who helped. Thank you to CCTV for taping today so that people can watch this who couldn't be here. Thank you to all of our board members um, and other volunteers who helped us set up today. We have Megan and Mitch um, and uh, Noah, my kiddo, who's in the back of the room and has helped us with today. Um, and then um, lastly, I have an amazing staff. 
So I get to be the face of this work, but I did the, they did most of the work. <laughs> so uh, Bianca and Evan and Andrew and Sierra are all here in the room. Hopefully you saw them at some point. There are, like, I'm sure many of you know, there's so many details that go into organizing something like this and making sure that everyone really feels special. I hope you did. Um, and um, that really honors the people in the room. Um, and they just have been, we've got such a great team that just pitches in to help out with whatever needs to happen to make sure that uh, this can feel like truly special for the people who are here. Um, and I want to have a special thank you to Bianca, who I have not seen this much this event because she's always in the back helping with something um, but she, you probably those of you who are awardees and speakers probably talked mostly to her she's the main organizer for this celebration and helped keep us all on track so thank you to Bianca um, I love reading the nominations I've said it I think like a bunch of times today not intentionally repeating myself but uh, reading the nominations is really great every year there's a lot of unsung heroes in our community um, I cannot tell you the number of times that I used to be the one who called people and um, told them they got the award. And um, I often heard stuff like, I didn't realize anyone was paying attention to that. Um, so I want to leave you with two things. First, to all of our awardees, people noticed. Um, we see you, and we know that today probably only scratched the surface of all the ways that you are working to make our community and our world a better place. And we thank you for all of it. Um, and for everybody else, don't forget to tell people when you notice and appreciate what they're doing. Uh, do it any, even if it feels awkward. We all need people to see and recognize our efforts even more these days. Um, so if you see someone making a contribution to health, safety, wellness in Burlington, consider nominating them for next year's Ruth to Prevention Award. You can nominate any point in the year. It's always on our website. Um, and we will get to come back here again next year. Um, creative solutions come from new connections. I hope you made some new connections today. Um, feel free to stay and chat more after we end. Continue making connections. Start conversations that lead to more positive changes for our community. Substance use is impacting everyone in the community in some way. And we need to wrap our attention and resources especially around prevention and reducing those long-term consequences. Because substance use prevention, sometimes we get caught up in the crisis, but substance use prevention is not the crisis. It's the steady long-term investment in policies and practices and education and community assets like all of you that prevent the constant need for a crisis response. So keep planning routes for prevention, and now and so that our children and our community can flourish in the forest that you create. Thank you, good night.